Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of First Chapter Friday, where we read the first chapter of a book together and hopefully spark some interest um, that you may want to pick up, a, pick up a new book and read it. I hope you're in, enjoying these. Um, all right, so Memorial Day weekend, y'all, the unofficial start to summer, can you believe it? Um, hopefully you're doing something fun this weekend and um you know things are starting to open back up again so hopefully you can maybe go hang out on a patio or you know have some a few friends over have a cookout something like that but with it being memorial day weekend i wanted to take this opportunity to um focus on a book it's an older book but something to honor our um, the fallen soldiers who have fought for our freedoms, and that's what um, this book is all about. So this book, and again, it's an older book, it is called Flags of Our Fathers by James Bradley, and this is a book about the, I want to say six, five or six young men who raised the flag on Iwo Jima. And it uh, gives us, you know, some backstory. It tells us how this photo happened. Um, it's a really kind of a cool book. Um, so on the back, it says, the best battle book I ever read. These stories from the time the six men, yeah, six, the six men who raised the flag at Iwo Jima enlisted, their training and the landing and subsequent struggle fill me with awe. And that's actually by, written by Stephen Ambrose, who is another author, historical author, uh, but unfortunately he actually passed away several years ago. So, Flags of Our Fathers. Let me read the inside flap and then we will read the first chapter. And y'all, there were so many, I really had trouble choosing because um, there's so many good books written um, about this time. And even, you know, I looked at, do I want to look at like some current? I looked at the Pat Tillman story. Do we want to do that? I looked at The Greatest Generation. I looked at um, Table in the Presence, which is about the battle in Fallujah and kind of the faith of the men. Um, and I just thought, I thought I would just kind of go back because there's so many things that had happened and how the country just really profoundly was affected during World War II. Um, I've actually since listened to um, it's actually kind of a documentary by Audible called, oh shoot, I just forgot what it's called, um, something like America during the home, the home front, America during World War II, and it's narrated by Martin Sheen, and um, it has actual um, verbiage and actual recordings of people talking about their experiences at, during America on the home front, and so it, it was fascinating as well. Um, anyway, so Flags of Our Fathers, I digress by James Bradley. Inside flap. I have something marked in here. I wonder what I have marked. Anyway, in this unforgettable chronicle of perhaps the most famous moment in American military history, James Bradley has captured the glory, the triumph, the heartbreak, and the legacy of the six men who raised the flag at Iwo Jima. Here is a true story behind the immortal photograph that has come to symbolize the courage and indomitable will of America. And if you're not familiar, this image was actually, um, this is actually when you go to Washington DC, there's a Marine Corps Memorial and it's, and it's this. And it was so cool, I was actually there um, little, about a year ago and I have a friend of mine in choir, we were, I was there with my choir, and um, a friend of mine who's a former Marine had never seen this particular statue and just he was in such awe and I was able to take a picture of him in front of that statue and it was just like such a cool experience but anyway if you didn't know that all right continue in February of 1945 American Marines plunged into the surf at Iwo Jima and into history through a hail of machine gun and mortar fire that left the beaches strewn with comrades they battled to the, to the island's highest peak, and after climbing through a landscape of hell itself, they raised a flag. Now the son of one of the flag raisers has written a powerful account of six very different men who came together in a moment that will live forever. Okay, so James Bradley is the son of one of these six men. To his family, John Bradley never spoke of the photograph or the war. 
But after his death, at age 70, his family discovered closed boxes of letters and photos. In Flags of Our Fathers, James Bradley draws on those documents to retrace the lives of his father and the men of his company. Following these men's paths to Iwo Jima, James Bradley has written a classic story of the heroic battle for the Pacific's most crucial island, an island riddled with Japanese tunnels and 22,000 fanatic defenders who would fight for the last man. But perhaps the most interesting part of the story is what happened after the victory. The men in the photo, three were killed during the battle, were proclaimed heroes and flown home to become reluctant symbols. For two of them, the adulation was shattering. Only James Bradley's father truly survived, displaying no copy of the famous photograph in his home, telling his son only, the real heroes of Iwo Jima were the guys who didn't come back. Few books have ever captured the complexity and furor of war and its aftermath, as well as Flags of Our Fathers. A penetrating, epic look at a generation at war, this is history told with keen insight, enormous honesty, and the passion of a son paying homage to his father. It is the story of the difference between truth and myth, the meaning of being a hero, and the essence of the human experience of war. Okay, so chapter one. Chapter one is called Sacred Ground. It's been years since I've read this, y'all. Ah, pages are sticking together. It's kind of human outside today, so pages are kind of sticking. The only thing new in the world is the history that you don't know. And that's a quote by Harry Truman. In the spring of 1998, six boys called to me from half a century ago on a distant mountain, and I went there. For a few days, I set aside my comfortable life, my business concerns, my life in Rye, New York, and made a pilgrimage to the other side of the world to a primitive fly speck island in the Pacific. There, waiting for me, was the mountain the boys had climbed in the midst of a terrible battle half a century earlier. One of them was my father. The mountain was called Serbachi, the island I Iwo Jima. The fate, hang on, I got texts and emails and stuff coming in that I think sometimes interfere with um, the sound. The fate of the late 20th, uh, 20th and 21st centuries was being forged, on, forged in blood on that island and others like it. The combatants on either side were kids, kids who had mostly come of age in cultures that resembled those of the 19th century. My young father and his five comrades were typical of these kids. Tired, scared, thirsty, brave. Tiny integers in the vast confusion of war making, trying to do their duty, trying to survive. But something unusual happened to these six. History turned all its focus for one four hundredth of a second on them. It froze them in an elegant instant of battle, froze them in a camera lens as they hoisted an American flag on a makeshift pole. Their collective image, blurred and indistinct yet unforgettable, became the most recognized, the most reproduced in the history of photography. It gave them a kind of immortality, I'm sorry, immorality, no, immortality, I had it right the first time, big difference. Immortality, a faceless immortality. The flag raising on Iwo Jima became a symbol of the island, the mountain, the battle, of World War II, of the highest ideals of the nation, of valor incarnate. It became everything except the salvation of the boys who formed it. There's a footnote down here that I just saw. In this picture at the beginning of the chapter, it says that it's James Bradley on the beach of Iwo Jima. So when he went, um, he said that, you know, the, these, the voices of these six were calling out to him. And so he went there and that's actually a picture of him, of him walking along Iwo Jima. All right, there's some construction or something going on and I'm hearing like drills and jackhammers and stuff. So 
For these six, history had a different set of agendas. Three were killed in action in the continuing battle. Of the three survivors, two were overtaken and eventually destroyed, dead of drink and heartbreak. Only one of them managed to live in peace into an advanced age. He achieved this peace by willing the past into a cave of silence. My father, John Henry Bradley, returned home to small town Wisconsin after the war. He shoved the mementos of his immortality into a few cardboard boxes and hid these in a closet. He married his third grade sweetheart. He opened a funeral home, fathered eight children, joined the PTA, the Lions, the Elks, and shut out any conversation on the topic of raising the flag on Iwo Jima. When he died in January of 1994, in the town of his birth, he might have, be he might have believed he was taking the unwanted story of his part in the flag raising with him to the grave, where he apparently felt it belonged. He had trained us as children to deflect the phone call requests for media interviews that never diminished over the years. We were to tell the caller that our father was on a fishing trip, but John Bradley never fished. No copy of the, famous, of the famous photograph hung in our house. When we did manage to extract from him a remark about the incident, his responses were short and simple and he quickly changed the subject. And this is how we Bradley children grew up. Happily enough, deeply connected to our peaceful tree shaded town, but always with a sense of an unsolved mystery somewhere at the edges of the picture. We sensed that the outside world knew something important about him that we would never know. For him, it was a dead issue, a boring topic, but not for the rest of us, me especially. For me, a middle child among the eight, the mystery, my nose is itching, the mystery was tantalizing. I knew from an early age that my father had been some sort of hero. My third grade school teacher said so. Everybody said so. I hungered to know the heroic part of my dad, but try as I might, I could never get him to tell me about it. The real heroes of Iwo Jima, he said once, coming as close as he ever would, are the guys who didn't come back. John Bradley might have succeeded in taking his story to his grave had we not stumbled upon the cardboard boxes a few days after his death. My mother and brothers, Mark and Patrick, were searching for my father's will in the apartment he had maintained at his private office. In a dark closet, they discovered three heavy cardboard boxes, old but in good shape, stacked on top of each other. In those boxes, my father had saved the many photos and documents that came his way as a flag raiser. All of us were surprised that he had saved anything at all. Later, I rummaged through the boxes. One letter caught my eye. The cancellation indicated it was mailed from Iwo Jima on February 26, 1945. A letter written by my father to his folks just three days after the flag raising. The carefree, reassuring style of his sentences offers no hint of the hell he had just been through. He managed to sound as though he were on a rugged but enjoyable Boy Scout hike. Hang on. Got more texts coming in from my, from my students. Grades are, grades are due. Let's see, he managed to sound as though he were on a rugged but enjoyable Boy Scout hike. I'd give my left arm for a good shower and a clean shave. I have a six day beard. Haven't had any soap or water since I hit the beach. I never knew I could go without food, water, or sleep for three days, but I know now it can be done. And then almost as an aside, he wrote, you know all about our battle out here. I was with the victorious Easy Company who reached the top of Mount Sirbachi first. I had a little to do with raising the American flag and it was the happiest moment of my life. The happiest moment of his life. Hang on, I'm sorry. Like I said, I got emails going crazy. The happiest moment of his life. What a shock to read that. I wept as I realized the flag raising had been a happy moment for him as a 21 year old. What happened in the intervening years to cause his silence? Reading my father's letter made the flag raising photo somehow come alive in my imagination. 
Over the next few weeks, I found myself staring at the photo on my office wall, daydreaming. Who were those boys with their hands on that pole? I wondered. Were they like my father? Had they known one another before that moment or were they strangers united by a common duty? Did they joke with one another? Did they have nicknames? Was the flag raising the happiest moment of each of their lives? The quest to answer those questions consumed four years. At its outset, I could not have told you if there were five or six flag raisers in that photograph. Certainly, I did not know the names of the three who died during the battle. By its conclusion, I knew each of them like I, knew, like I know my brothers, like I know my high school chums, and I had grown to love them. What I discovered on that quest forms the content of this book. The quest ended symbolically with my own pilgrimage to Iwo Jima. Accompanied by my 74-year-old mother, three of my brothers, and many military men and women, I ascended the 550-foot volcanic crater that was Mount Sirbachi. My 21-year-old father had made the climb on foot carrying bandages and medical supplies. Our party was whisked up in marine corps vans. I stood at its summit in a whipping wind that helped dry my tears. This was exactly where that American flag was raised on a February afternoon, 53 years before. The wind had whipped on that day as well. It had straightened the rippling fabric of that flag by its force. Not many Americans make it to Iwo Jima these days. It's a shrine of World War II, but it is not an American shrine. A closed Japanese naval base, it is inaccessible, inaccessible uh, to civilians of all nationalities except for rare government sanctioned visits. I did not know that. It was the commander of the Marine Corps, General Charles Krulak, who made our trip possible. He offered to fly us from Okinawa to Iwo Jima on his own plane. My mother, Betty, and three of my brothers, Steve, then 48, Mark, 47, and Joe, 37, made the trip with me. I was 44. Not everyone in the clan could. Brothers Patrick and Tom stayed at home, as did sisters Kathy and Barbara. Departing Okinawa for the island on a rain-swept Tuesday aboard General Krulak's plane, we were warned that we could expect similar weather at our destination. But two hours later, as we began our descent to Iwo Jima, the clouds suddenly parted and Sirbachi loomed ahead of us bathed in bright sun, a ghost mountain from the past thrust suddenly into our vision. As the plane banked its wings, circling the island twice to allow us, to, uh, allow us close up photographs of Sirbachi and the outline of the terrain, <coughs> excuse me, the commandment began speaking of Iwo Jima in a low voice as being holy land and sacred ground. It's holy ground to both us and the Japanese, he added thoughtfully at one point. A red carpet was rolled out and waiting for my mother as she stepped off the plane, the first of us to exit. A cadre of Japanese soldiers stood at strict attention along one side. U.S. Marines flanked the other. General Krulak presented my mother to the Japanese commandant, command, commandant, commandant on the island, Commander Kochi. We were, indeed, the guests of the commander in his small garrison. American forces might have captured Iwo Jima in the early weeks of 1945, but today the island is part of Japan's sovereign state. Unlike in 1945, we had landed this time with their permission. A visitor is inevitably struck by the impression that Iwo Jima is a very small place to have hosted such a big battle. The island is a trivial scab barely cresting the infinite Pacific, its eight square miles only about a third the mass of Manhattan Island. 100,000 men battled one another here for over a month, making this one of the most intense and closely fought battles of any war. 80,000 American boys fought above ground, 20,000 Japanese boys fought from below. They were hidden in a sophisticated tunnel system that crisscrossed the island, reinforced tunnels that had rendered the ferociously firing Japanese all but invisible to the exposed attackers. 
16 miles of tunnels connecting 1,500 man-made caverns. Many surviving Marines never saw a live Japanese soldier on Iwo Jima. They were fighting an enemy that they could not see. We boarded Marine vans and drove to the hospital cave, an enormous underground hospital where Japanese surgeons had quietly operated on their wounded 40 feet below advancing Marines. Hospital beds had been carved into the volcanic rock walls. When we, we then entered a large cavern that had housed Japanese mortarmen. On the cavern wall were markers that corresponded to the elevations of the sloping beaches. This allowed the Japanese to angle their mortar tubes so they could hit the invading Marines accurately. The beaches of Iwo Jima had been pre-registered for Japanese fire. The hill the Marines walked through had been rehearsed for months. We drove across the island to the old combat site where my father had been wounded two weeks after the flag raising. I noticed that the ground was hard and rust colored. I, sc I stooped down and picked up one of the shards of rock that littered the surface. Examining it up close, I realized that it was not a rock at all. It was a piece of shrapnel. This is what we had mistaken for natural terrain, fragments of exploded artillery shells. Half a century old, they still formed a kind of carpet here. My father carried some of that shrapnel in his leg and foot to his grave. Then it was on to the invasion beaches, the sands of Iwo Jima. We walked across the beach closest to Mount Sirbachi. The invading Marines had dubbed it Green Beach. And it was across this killing field that young John Bradley, a Navy corpsman, raced under decimating fire. Now I watched as my mother made her way across that same beach, sinking to her ankles in the soft volcanic sand with each step. I don't know how anyone survived, she exclaimed. I watched her move carefully in the wind and sunlight. A small, white-haired widow now, but a world ago, a pretty little girl named, Bet Betsy, named Betty uh, Van Gorp of Appleton, Wisconsin, who found herself in third, in third grade class with a new boy, a serious boy named John. My father walked Betty home from school every day for the stretch of the early 1930s when he lived in Appleton because her house was on his street. When he came home from World War II, a decade and a half later, he married her. 200 yards inland from where she now stood, on the third day of the assault, John Bradley saw an American boy fall in the distance. He raced through the mortar and machine gun fire to the wounded Marie, administered plasma from a bottle strapped to a rifle he planted in the sand, and then dragged the boy to safety as bullets pinged off the rocks. For his heroism, he was awarded the Navy Cross, second only to the Medal of Honor. John Bradley never confided the details of his valor to Betty. Our family did not learn of his Navy Cross until after he had died. Now, Steve took my mother's arm and steadied her as she walked up the thick sand terraces. Mark stood at the water's edge, lost in thought, facing out to sea. Joe and I saw a blockhouse overlooking the beach and made our way to it. The Japanese had installed more than 750 blockhouses and pillboxes around the island. Little igloos of rounded concrete reinforced with steel rods to make them virtually impervious even to artillery rounds. Many of their smashed white carcasses stood still, like skeletons of animals half a century dead, at intervals along the island. The blockhouses were hideous remnants of the island defenders' uh, fanaticism in a cause they knew was lost. The soldiers assigned to them had the mission of killing as many invaders as possible before their own inevitable deaths. Joe and I entered the squat cement structure we could see that the machine gun muzzle still protruding uh, through its firing slit was bent, probably from overheating as it killed American boys. We squeezed our way inside. There were two small rooms, dark except for the brilliant light shining through the hole. One room for shooting, the other for supplies and concealment against the onslaught. Hunched with my brother in the confining darkness, I tried to imagine the invasion from the viewpoint of a defending blockhouse occupant. 
He created terror with his unimpeded field of fire, but he must have been terrified himself. A trapped killer. He knew that he would die there, probably from the searing heat of a flamethrower thrust a flamethrower thrust through uh, the firing hole by a desperate young marine who had managed to survive the machine gun spray. What must it have been like to crouch in that blockhouse and watch the American Ar Armada materialize offshore? How many days, how many hours did he have to live? Would he attain his assigned kill ratio of 10 enemies before he was slaughtered? What must it have been like for an American boy to advance toward him? I thought of my own interactions with the Japanese when I was in my early 20s. I attended college in Tokyo and my choices were study or sushi. But for too many on bloody Iwo, there were no choices. It had been kill or be killed. But now it was time to ascend the mountain. Standing where they raised the flag at the edge of the extinct volcanic crater, the wind whipping our hair, we could view the entire two mile beach where the Armada had discharged its boatloads of attacking Marines. In February, 1945, the Japanese could see it with equal clarity from the tunnels just beneath us. They waited patiently until the beach was, was chock-a-block with American boys. They had spent many months pre-positioning their gun sites. When the time came, they simply opened fire, beginning, beginning one of the great military slaughters of all history. An oddly out of place feeling now seized me. I was so glad to be up here. The vista below us, despite the gory freight of its history, was invigorating. The sun and the wind seemed to, have, seemed to bring all of us alive. And then I realized that my high spirits were not so out of place at all. I was reliving something. I was recalling the line from the letter my father wrote three days after the flag raising. It was the happiest moment of my life. Yes, it had to be exhilarating to raise that flag. From Sirbachi, you feel on top of the world, surrounded by ocean. But how had my father's attitude shifted from that to, if only there hadn't been a flag attached to that pole? As some 20 young Marines and older officers milled around us, we Bradleys began to take pictures of one another. We posed in various spots, included near the X that marks the spot of the actual raising. We had brought with us a plaque, shiny red, in the mitten shape of Wisconsin and made of Wisconsin ruby red granite, the state stone. Part of our mission here was to embed this plaque on the rough, rocky soil. Now my brother Mark scratched in that soil with a jackknife. He swept the last pebbles from the newly bared, bared area and said, okay, it should fit now. Joe gently placed the plaque in the dry soil. It read, to John H. Bradley, flag raiser, February 23rd, 1945, from his family. We stood up, dusted our hands, and gazed in our handiwork. The wind blew through our hair. The hot Pacific sun beat down on us. Our allotted time on the mountain was drawing short. I trotted over to one of the Marine vans to retrieve a folder that I had carried with me from New York for this occasion. It contained notes and photographs, a few photographs of Bradley's, but mostly of the six young men. Let's do this now, I called to my family and the Marines who accompanied us up the mountain as I motioned them over to the marble monument which stands atop the mountain. When the Marines had gathered in front of the memorial, Everyone was silent for a moment. The world was silent except for whipping wind. And then I began to speak. I spoke of the battle. It ground on over 36 days. It claimed 25,851 US casualties, including nearly 7,000 dead. Most of the 22,000 defenders fought to their deaths. It was America's most heroic battle. More medals for valor were awarded for action on Iwo Jima than in any map battle in the history of the United States. To put that into perspective, 
the Marines were awarded 84 Medals of Honor in World War II. Over four years, that was, uh, that was 22 a year, about two a month. But in just one month of fighting on this island, they were awarded 27 Medals of Honor, one third of their accumulated total. I spoke then of the famous flag raising photograph. I remarked that nearly everyone in the world recognizing it, recognizes it, but no one knows the boys. I glanced toward the freeze, the freeze on the monument, a rendering of the photo's image. I'd like to tell you, I said, a little about them now. I pointed to the figure in the middle of the image, solid, anchoring, with both hands clamped firmly on the rising pole. Here is my father, I said. He is the most identifiable of the six figures, the only one whose profile is visible. Sorry, I just want to look again. Um, but for half a century, he was almost completely silent about Iwo Jima. To his wife of 47 years, he spoke about it only once on their first date. It was not until after his death that we learned of the Navy Cross. In his quiet humility, he kept that from us. Why was he so silent? I think the answer is summed up in his belief that the true heroes of Iwo Jima were the ones who didn't come back. There were other reasons for my father's silence as I had learned in the course of my quest, but now was not the time to share them with these Marines. I pointed next to a figure on the far side of John Bradley, and most, most obscured by him, the handsome mill hand from New Hampshire. Rene Gagnon stood shoulder to shoulder with my dad in the photo, I said, but in real life, they took the opposite approach to fame. When everyone acclaimed Rene as a hero, his mother, the president, Time Magazine, and audience across the country, he believed them. He thought he would benefit from his celebrity. Like a moth, Rene was attracted to the flame of fame. I gestured now to the figure on the far right of the image toward the leaning, thrusting figure jamming the base of the pole into the hard Sirbachi ground. His right knee is nearly level with his shoulder. Hang on, got another text coming in. Uh, da, 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 da. His right knee is nearly level with his shoulder. His buttocks strain against his fatigues. The Texan. Harlan Block, I said a star football player who enlisted in the Marines with all of the seniors on his, foot, on his high school football team. Harlan died six days after they raised the flag, and then he was forgotten. Harlan's back is to the camera, and for almost two years, this figure was misidentified. America believed it was another Marine who also died on Iwo Jima. But his mother, Belle, was convinced it was her boy, Nobody believed her, not her husband, her family, or her neighbors, and we would never have known it was Harlan if a certain stranger had not walked into the family cotton field in South Texas and told them that he had seen their son Harlan put that pole in the ground. Next, I pointed to the figure directly in back of my father, the Huck Finn of the group, the freckle-faced Kentuckian. Here's Franklin Susley from Hilltop, Kentucky, I said. He was fatherless, at the age of nine and sailed for the Pacific on his 19th birthday. Six months earlier, he had said goodbye to friends on the porch of the Hilltop General Store. He said, when I come back, I'll be a hero. Days after the flag raising, the folks back in Hilltop were celebrating their hero, but a few weeks after that, they were mourning him. I gazed at the freeze for a moment before I went on. Look closely at Franklin's hand. I asked the silent crowd in front of me, do you see his right hand? Can you tell that the man in back of him has grasped Franklin's right hand and is helping Franklin push the heavy pole? The most boyish of the flag raisers, I said, is getting help from the most mature, their veteran leader, the Sergeant Mike Strink. So I'm just wanting to look at all of them. I pointed now to what could, what could be seen of Mike. Mike is on the far side of Franklin, I said. You can hardly see him, but his helping young Franklin was typical of him. 
He was respected as a great leader, a Marine's Marine. To the boys that didn't, uh, to the boys that didn't mean that Sergeant Mike was a rough, tough killer. It meant that Mike understood his boys and would try to protect their lives as they pursued their dangerous mission. And Sergeant Mike did his best until the end. He was killed as he was drawing a diagram in the sand showing his boys the safest way to attack a position. Finally, I, ge I gestured to the figure at the far left of the image. The figure stretching upward, his fingertips not quite reaching the pole. The Pima Indian from Arizona. Ira Hayes, I said. His hands couldn't quite grasp the pole. I want to see it again. His hands couldn't quite grasp the pole. Later, back in the United States, Ira was hailed as a hero, but he didn't see, I'm sorry, but he didn't see it that way. How can I feel like a hero, he said, when I hit the beach with 250 buddies and only 27 of us walked off alive. Iwo Jima haunted Ira and he tried to escape the memories in the, battle, in the bottle. He died 10 years almost to the day after the photo was taken. Six boys. They form a representative picture of America in 1945. Back up. A mill worker from New England, a Kentucky tobacco farmer, a Pennsylvania coal miner's son, a Texan from the oil fields, a boy from Wisconsin's Dairyland, and an Arizona Indian. Right. Only two of them walked off this island. One was carried off with shrapnel embedded up and down his side. Three were buried here. And so they are also a representative picture of Iwo Jima. If you had taken a photo of any six boys amount, atop Mount Serbachi that day, it would have been the same, two thirds casualties. Two out of every th three boys who fought on this island of agony were killed or wounded. When I was finished with my talk, I couldn't look up at the faces in front of me. I sensed the strong emotion in the air. Quietly, I suggested that in honor of my dad, we all sing the only two songs John Bradley ever admitted to knowing, Home on the Range and I've Been Working on the Railroad. We sang. All of us in the sun and the whipping wind. I knew without looking up that everyone standing on this mountaintop with me, Marines, young and old, women and men, my family was weeping. Tears, <clears throat> tears were streaming down my own face. Behind me, I could hear the hoarse sobs coming from my brother Joe. I hazarded one glance upward at Sergeant Major Lewis Lee, the highest ranking enlisted man enlisted man in the Corps. Tanned, his sleeves rolled up over brawny forearms, muscular Sergeant, Sergeant Major Lee looked like a man who could eat a gun, never mind shoot one. Tears glistened on his chiseled face. Holy land, sacred ground. And then it was over. Time to board the vans and head back down Sirbachi. My brothers and I became like young boys in our last moments at Liberty on the mountain. We scrambled down the slopes to collect souvenir rocks. Steve took photos of Joe, Mark and me peering over the side of Serbachi, a gesture several Marines had made on the day the flag was raised. Finally, we gathered the photographs I retrieved from the van and tossed them into the wind over the mountainside. Images of our loved ones and of the six boys distributed across the sacred ground. Then I turned to face the Marine contingent, the uniformed strangers who had now become our friends, even part of our family. Thanks for being here, I said to them. And then the Bradleys turned away, leaving the mountain and soon the island to its heroic ghosts. That's the end of chapter one. Oh, just wait, I wanna read this again now. All right, so again, um, honoring those who fought and died um, to afford us the freedoms that we, so many of us take for granted today. So um, if you see a veteran, thank them today, honor them, respect them, celebrate patriotism, celebrate America. And um, I hope you enjoy this. Let me know if you read it, let me know what you think.